start. Yes. Start button has been pushed. I will now share my screen. I didn't make any notes. I'm just going to highlight some things from the book, if that's okay. Sure. And if it's not okay, that's still what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting near the end, man. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's. I said it. Yeah. So um, let me see if I can remember how to share my screen now. Where's the thingy? Zoom. There it is. That's interesting. Okay, so hopefully you can see the screen or the book. Yes? Yep. Hold okay. On. Yes, yes. Okay, so let me see if I can make this a little bigger. We don't need a sidebar here. Go away sidebar. Okay. Um, so this is chapter 20. Um, this uh, basically this, the essence of this chapter is assume you have all the confounders that there possibly could be measured right mm -hmm. you may think oh well we're done we don't need to worry about anything now we, we know everything but the problem is even if you measure them all you don't necessarily have a good model to use the control for them mm -hmm. and that's kind of the essence here is that you know remember all models are wrong you know typically what do we do we assume it's a linear dependence on the confounder right we put that in there oh maybe maybe an interaction or something but it's probably, there's no reason to believe the dependence on that thing is uh, linear. And so you still have to consider the balance between uh, in the compound, balance and uh, overlap in the compound. So that's kind of the essence of this chapter, right? Even though you've got it measured, you still would like to make it more balanced just so that the uh, results aren't too sensitive on that model you're assuming for the confounders. Mm -hmm. That's basically this whole chapter in a nutshell. It's a dense chapter otherwise um, with a lot of examples um, that are kind of given mostly in text. It's mostly text, this whole chapter is a lot of text. So I'm just gonna hit the highlights of it. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but this is a big chat, by the way, like I, yeah. I didn't even get a chance to read the whole thing. <laughs> I uh, skimmed a lot of it, but it's I a lot. Try. This is a long chapter. Every time I finish a section, I go, well, there we go. That's a good place to stop this chapter. Nope. Let me go. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, so, you know, this is the whole section. This is the first part is kind of just what I just said about the challenge, the issue with the fact that even if you have the compounder met, well, first of all, if you don't have, if you have omitted variables, then you're obviously going to have problems, right? And he gives an example of where there's some admitted bi bi uh, bias, and you actually can get the opposite result to what, what you'd expect, right? right? Or if you know if it's a simulated example, you could easily get the opposite result by leaving out some. Uh, some other confounder that you need. Um, so that's what the first section was. Um, oh, this one thing just to make clear here, what is a confounding bit covariate here? Uh, basically a confounder needs to be something that has two associations, it needs to be associated with the outcome, right? If it wasn't associated with the outcome, then it's not a confounder at all, right? It doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. it also needs to be associated with your the treatment selection. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were randomly treat, if the treatment selection was random on this particular compounder, then also wouldn't matter, right? Yeah. Um, so it would be a, it would be a compounder, but I guess it's not an important compounder, right? Not good. No, he said it's not a compounder because there'd be no bias. That's the point, right? Mm -hmm. So you need both. Basically, in this in his terminology here, you need both beta and gamma to be non-zero in order for this effect to show up. That's what he demonstrates here. It's pretty. The math is maybe too much, but that's basically like, it's pretty straightforward to my, my mind, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. So they, the whole purpose of this chapter is observational studies. And he just says it, he uses it to refer to any non-experimental research design mm -hmm. at all. And he just makes clear that in an observational study, there clearly can be some systematic differences between the, the, the different groups that receive the treatment and the control, since you didn't have any, <laughs> you didn't have any way to control that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and then, like you said, these different confounders, I guess now we define as confounders, uh, can affect the outcome, right? And the treatment, right? So that's the idea there. And so let's see, I summarized that already. If you go see the electric company, I'm not going to repeat that. Right. All right. So then he talks about this assumption of, this is a kind of review of something we already talked about, the idea that if the outcomes are, the potential, potential outcomes are independent of the treatment, conditioned on the covariates. That's the key thing we're, we're hoping for, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's the key assumption of this whole thing, that if we can condition on the covariates, then the um, treatment assignment is um, ignorable, I guess you say, right? Right. So this is one other thing I highlighted here is our hope, <laughs> right? 
is that the units in each block defined now by these confounding variables have the property of balanced potential outcomes that would have resulted if they had actually been randomized. So that's kind of the key assumption of an observational study, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a leap of faith, he says. We have conditioned on the appropriate set of compounders such a distribution of potential outcomes for observations with the same level of those compounders is the same across treatment groups. So that's just something you just have to take as a leap of faith when you do these observational states, like an underlying assumption of this whole thing. There's not some additional uh, thing to determine that oh, all the people in the treatment group, <laughs> yeah. you know, coincidentally, all have this uh, value. There's a lot of people that say that, you know, no matter what you do, there's always some unmeasured covariate or confounder or something. I mean, you know I mean? that's true. That's true. But that's why he's saying this. I mean, even in the beginning of the thing, he says the assumption that you measure them all. He's saying, even if you did have that, which you won't, <laughs> then there's still yeah. issues. There's still issues you'd like to be right. able to solve, which is kind of interesting, I thought. Let's see more math. Okay, so now we get to the kind of the, the crux of the whole thing. What can we do to try to make our, our outcome measurements here less sensitive to our bad models <laughs> of the mm -hmm. confounders, which they're all models are bad, right? Our wrong models. Is right. So that's, the, well, I guess he breaks into two things, imbalance and overlap. And so in this section, he talks about the imbalance, which is kind of what I was kind of harping on more, and that the you know, imbalance makes you the model, you're, you're sensitive to your models. Uh, the overlap, um, lack of complete overlap is when um, you're, let's say one of your confounders is age, right? And you've got a huge section where of young people that none of them got the treatment. Well, you, you have yep. no possibility of, of, you pretty much have to leave those guys out, right? Yeah. If age is a, co a true confounder. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this actually that. happens. Um, I used to work for like a, a, a digital therapeutic startup where, I mean, we just did the observational stuff where people used our product to like, you know, help with their anxiety and depression. So there's all these kind of like these online intervent, you know, kind of exercises and things that help with your mental health. Well, the problem is, is um, who do you think, is, which gender do you think was more assiduous with using the product more carefully and like more extensively? over time not men not men exactly right? all the other genders <laughs> yeah all the other genders are, yeah are, are fine um but yeah i know there's kind of like that confound of usage yeah. you know kind of intensity or whatever you know and it was sort of confounded with a lot of things like um well and also age like older people were less likely to want to use it yeah. like that so yeah it sucks <laughs> it's frustrating yeah uh, so the issue there, basically, he calls it the issue of model extra. It's still a problem with model sensitivity, but now it's a problem that you're extracting your model mm -hmm. for your confounder off in places you have no data, right? Which we know when you extrapolate, it's never good. <laughs> right. Uh, so let's see. Uh, he does mention here just briefly that when we get to propensity, one way to measure overlap is just only with by using the propensity score, and you can use that to you know, bracket the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, limiting your analysis to that, to those observations in a certain region. Of course, and also you have to be very clear about that. And that's what we're, you know, that's what we're actually measuring the treatment effect with respect to that particular group. Right. Uh, let's see. So then he does this example of the child care program. Did you get this far in your reading? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, like I said, I read, I, well, I mean, I kind of focused on the stuff about propensity scores because that's what I ended up spending some time on. Okay, okay good. Yeah, no, like this this thing here is what's called, a, it's actually a name for 2029, it's actually called a love plot, um, which is, well, actually, I think, it is, I think this is, like, well, maybe, yeah, these are all confound, these are all covariates, right? Yeah, my yeah. one of my professors, this guy named Tom Love, invented this particular huh. Thing. Is that right? That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's weird because it's love plot. It sounds like, you know, you're talking about some kind yeah. of statistical analysis of, of romance or something like that. But no, it's just Tom Love. So in this case, there was 4,500 children, uh, all born in the 80s, apparently. And they took some subset of them and they got special services in the first few years of their lives, uh, including high quality child care and in the uh, anyway, some kind of intervention, the infant health development program. Um, and they were targeted because they were born prematurely and had low birth weight. So that's a clear confounder now because it's in there that they were particularly chosen for treatment, right? Um, and so it's not surprising you look at this imbalance chart now between the treatment and the control that there's a big giant imbalance in terms of uh, uh, how, how long, pre how well, first of all, birth weight. And then, of course, 
correlated with that is how many weeks preterm, right? And days in hospitals also correlated with that. So it's no surprise you see these big dots out there. Mm -hmm. the, the hollow dots are the, what we're talking about here, the solid dots are when he does some uh, matching later. We'll, we'll talk yep. about that later. But yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. So, so this is clearly going to be an issue if we try to uh, do a simple average treatment effect because they're not balanced. Even if we do put in birth weight and everything else, it's a huge imbalance. We'd have to maybe have a very good model, nonlinear model or something of dependence on birth weight or maybe just limit, limit our study to only the small birth weight or something. There's things you can do, right? But you can't just say we've controlled for it just because it's a variable that we've measured. Right. Uh, oh, the outcome here was the IQ test at age three. Well, they call it, it's not really an IQ test. It's some kind of test. He's calling it an IQ test. Similar oh, yeah, to an IQ measure. There's plenty of, there's tons of like IQ tests for kids, yeah. It's some kind of test. It's yeah. like an IQ measure. Uh, let's see, you mentioned about missing data that he uses some uh, imputation that we learned previously to fill in. Uh, the data that he provides actually already had this done, so I didn't, I didn't get, I couldn't see how, I'm going to jump over to our studio here in a moment and look at this uh, code, mm -hmm. this data and code for this example. And I have to look at his oh, article. I didn't even see that. Oh, there's, okay. Well, well I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I am using the Lalon data set, which is, you know, that's, um, in the first uh, thing but yeah I, I didn't i guess i i guess i did see well, I, don't know. I guess i i didn't it doesn't see. get to the propensity part so it doesn't um i don't think so it actually it doesn't get to i don't think it gets to the propensity part so you should be no very little overlap with what you're doing but speaking of overlap um the, the thing one issue with this is there's the the tidyverse version of this doesn't go very far at all i know uh, the, and because i think because they just you know the they run into the same problem we had. This, yeah. yeah, like, oh, well, I don't have a, I don't want to get the survey package in here and try to like, you know, survey is probably not tidyverse compatible or something. I don't know what the issues are, but yeah, this is a whole like cottage industry in, you know, it research. seems like it is. Yeah. yeah, this whole idea of using what's called propensity square matching or weighting. I've never heard of it. This is, yeah, no, this, this whole is... thing is new to me. I mean, of course, I don't do these kind of things, so I'm not that surprised, but no, no, no it's cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, but people do this in like non medical stuff. I mean, you can do it in like, obviously this is like economics here and yeah it is interesting it's so, hard yeah. I, will, I, will, I will say this i mean um i've had a lot of people um, people want to hire me to be like a consultant to do this stuff um but the, one of the biggest problems is is you have to have lots and lots of potential covariates and apparently like, yeah yeah there's all kinds of like uh, heart you know like um treatment studies and different medical studies with like you know cancers and stuff where they look at people who got the treatment or didn't and they might have a hundred covariates you know what i mean and uh, so um that's part of the, one of the things that's problematic in doing this stuff is i mean even in the example that they you know that i give i think there's only like four or five um of covariates so that you just never would be able to do that just because you would never really have any confidence that you've got you've covered stuff yeah exactly and that's what he said i mean he talks about that too in the chapter i think i highlighted something about that later but uh the issue being that you know you need a lot of covariates but you gotta be careful you don't want to throw every possible covariate at the thing because then you end up with issues yeah. You know, collinear, you may think, oh, maybe it doesn't matter, but it can still cause you all kinds of problems with collinear. Fun, fun fact, I almost did a postdoc with Gene Brooks Gunn like 10, 15 years ago. So that's the best. The, that's oh, this the, guy, yeah. Yeah, she's a famous child. She, yeah. I mean, my background's in developmental psychology, but yeah, I, uh, I, I was, you know, reaching out. I was talking to her like a long, long time ago about maybe working with her. It never worked out. So you can see this uses a lot of libraries. Well, I mean, the only library for sure that I'd never used for this survey thing. Mm -hmm. uh, now matching is available in some libraries, but he just makes his own code for it. And that uses some other libraries. So if you try to do this, you're like, oh, I got, okay, I installed survey, I'm good to go. Then you're like, try, no, so it doesn't work because inside one of these other ones, it's another library. Yeah, uh, you, you're, you're doing a lot better than me. I couldn't, I didn't even know about this. I had to go back and use old code from an old project just to like give an example. I'm actually not sure this is going to be in the wrong directory, but no, it seems to work. Okay. Because it's not using here, it's just using its own thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, it worked. Okay. So this uh, read in the data for the child care data, mummage. No, mommy. Mummage. I like that. Mummage. <laughs> I love that word. Yeah, that's a great word. I mean, non word, I should say. Yeah. Uh, and so here's all the data he talks about in the book, whether they're prenatal or not, uh, whether she smoked booze. <laughs> that's why I noticed that. Um, booze. Yeah. 
Moms that, so mom, moms we have moms that, moms that drank and then moms that lied about it. In the eighties, mom six is she's uh, she's not hitting a thousand there. She's got cigarettes and booze. Mom six, cigarettes, yeah. Prenatal care, uh, yeah, sure I did. Did you work? Yeah, I had to work. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's not that bad to educate though. Hmm. Uh, let's see what else is in here. Age. As a, oh, so now this is the age as a double. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, the state, these are state codes. Like there's five states involved. So the states are coded in here. Income. And then this is the same education now decoded as a, um, a one hot, right? Mm -hmm. I, don't know what, I don't know what this is. PT category. No idea. Oh, is this hey. one? So this, this dummy coded a bunch of stuff? Is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. The dummy okay. coded a bunch of stuff. Anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter because all we're going to worry about is the things that he worries about in here. So this big old complicated plot here, what does this do? Oh, so this is the plot of looking at one uh, particular confound or birth rate. So he spends a lot of time on this first, right? So just looking at birth rate, um, what was their test score like uh, for the treated versus the non-treated? And the treated ones are the black dot, heavy dots and the untreated are the light dots. It's probably easier to see in the book, but we're here. Yeah, now. yeah, no worries. But yeah, you, can, um, you can see the big imbalance there. It's obviously a big imbalance. So right. And, and look at yeah, look at uh, you know, look at how um yeah, the um the, the you know, black are, they're all they're all really, really low, obviously. And right. So this fit here is probably not very reliable, right? It does show an effect, but I mean, look mm -hmm. at this. One of the, one of these lines is mostly fit from the down here, one of these lines is mostly fit from the data up in the higher yeah. So that's the issue there. Um, I guess it turns out this 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 measurement coincidentally it doesn't turn to be that bad compared to the true results. It's not true results, but it, one of the, the things with this uh, example is it actually it was a fully balanced experiment, not an observational study. He just turned it into an observational study. Right. That, that's really common, by the way. There's a lot of studies, especially like you know with like complicated populations where they'll do they'll 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 still use propensity score matching. And stuff, maybe even in a clinical trial, if things go bad, you know what I mean, or yeah. something goes off, yeah. And this just shows again some more issues with balance with the uh, uh, mother's education. There's good overlap. Every every education is represented somehow, but you can see that the ones that were selected for treatment are more balanced toward the lesser educated as far as far as balance. Overlap's good, balance not so great. And here, mm. the overlap and balance is bad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the two more examples. Let's see what else they're doing. I, I just looked at this yesterday. I already forgot what's coming now. Oh, so this is another. Uh, so here's another attempt to, to look instead now at uh, mom education only. Forget about the um, pretest mm -hmm. scores. Wait, was that what we did? Pretest scores? Not pretest score. Birth rate. Sorry, pre that's a totally different sample. So we're going to forget about birth rate. Just look at um, education to see what we get. And then he, he comes up with these treatment effects for the. Uh, four cases, right? And some standard error. Okay, fine. I forget why. Why did he do that? Let me look at the book. What was the point of that? Oh, so he's just, it's just shown as a subclass. Uh, mm -hmm. Example of doing subclassification and then computing average effects. Okay, so fine. Oh, the point of this, I mean, I should go back to the book for this. I don't want to, though. Let's see what we can do without doing that. The point of this is a couple of different things you could do with this, right? So let's assume this is the only confounder, blah, 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 right? Um, and we've done this by splitting it into four different groups and calculating it separately for each one, the treatment effect and the, right, the errors. Now we well, want to sorry, could, could, what, what, is, what does L mean? What is that? What is, sorry, uh, maybe I said something already and I just missed less it. Less than high school. Oh, okay. So this is I think that's what that means. So high school, less than high school, I'm guessing. Less than college, yeah. I don't know, left in college, they took some college maybe. Oh, that's very common. It's a very common way to measure this. It's like, yeah, it'll be like, you know, you know, did not graduate high school, did, you know, so yeah. depending on the sample, it might be like, did not finish middle school or, <laughs> yeah. or junior high. Well, that's included here in the 126 uh, treated people. Yeah, okay. But you can see there's the, you can see the, the imbalance is pretty clear here too, right? It's like, oh, look, the, in the treatment group, there was 126 at less than high school. And that's the biggest group where it's so the biggest group for this were all high school graduates. And, you know, even though, you know, I don't, I can't yeah. see the percent, I can't do the percentage calculation, but you can see that they're, we, well, we saw them up here, right? Right. Yeah. So this is the same thing. So, okay. So, um, so there's a couple of different 
things we do we can ask for the average treatment effect. Okay, that's fine. So there we just have to look at the total in each category, just adding these two columns together times the effect. We get the average treatment effect, the most straightforward way, right? Hey. Um, calculate the error with the usual root mean square method. Uh, he said more commonly in these kind of thing is the average treatment effect on the treated. How does he actually call that ATT, average treatment effect on the treated? Yeah, average treatment on the treated. Yeah, ATT is a common. And so there we're just using the numbers from what the population of yep. treatment group is, straightforward way, and calculate the error. You can also do average treatment on control, but that's less commonly right. done. I guess there could be a reason. Okay, so now we're back to propensity score matching. And this is what you said you have an example of. Should I go through this? Um, yeah, go ahead. Just go through it. Yeah, I mean, mine's different. Um, just I, it's not even really, I mean, it's not that even that well, that well finished. So go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll go I'll go after you. All right, so first he talks about, well, first we need to estimate the propensity score. So he in the book, he has this like five-step thing, right? <laughs> so yeah. step one is not here because um, we just, in the book, it says, okay, well, we're going to, what you're going to try to do here is matching. It's his first method. There's another mm -hmm. method you can do, like weighting as well, but you're going to start with matching. Um, and he says that refers to a uh, number of procedures, right? Uh, I'm looking at the book over here where I'm getting this from, uh, mm -hmm. that restructure the original sample to rebalance it in some way, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, we're trying to make this the analysis sample look more like it was done by a randomized experiment somehow. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So there's a how many steps? Five, I think. Yeah, yeah. five-step process. The five-step process. I know. That's where I started. That's where I finally got frustrated. I mean, I, I only started like, you know, a couple hours ago and I was like, this is going on for so long. Well, he does go through the five-step process twice because he first does it for this example. Then he goes through it again. We'll do that too because it actually is useful, but it's just, it is long. Okay. So step one is to find the confounders. Well, he's already done that. Um, remembering the confounders have to both uh, we predict the treatment and the outcome. Well, how do you do that? Maybe with other studies, maybe your own domain knowledge. Um, you have to figure that out, right? That's a, that's a big challenge. And he talks about that more in this chapter later, but that's what this part of the chapter says. And the other thing is ask, what are you trying to treat? Well, here we're going to look for the effect of the treated, treatment on the treated, but you could ask for different things. One thing he doesn't do here is like how to, he talks about how to do matches, matching for that case, right? Which seems pretty straightforward. He talks about how to do matching average treatment and control, but how do you do like average treatment effect total with matching? I don't know. Because I would have, who would I match with? I've used all, I need all the things, right? Maybe I have to generate a double sized data set. I don't know. Anyway, that's the open question I had. I didn't know about. Do you have any insight on that? Sorry, what was that? So here we're going to do matching uh, for the estimate of the average treatment effect on the treated, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to just do ATE, average treatment effect, it's not clear to me how you would actually do the matching in that case, right? But anyway. Yeah, well, that's, I'll show a little bit about like oh, how, okay. how it's done. All right. I, All right. Even I'm not, not an expert for sure. All right. Well, in any event, uh, here's the covariates. Um, these, he picks these ones because these are non-redundant, he says. Oh, we're not going to really worry about what they are. But you see this like high school. That's an, education was important. Um, mom age was important. Uh, uh, what is um, BWG? I don't know what that Body is. Body weights. Oh, that's the most, one of the most important, right? So. By the way, a lot of these, I mean, even though it looks like you have a lot of covariates, a lot of them are just dummy dummies of what used to be a yeah. variable. Like, yeah. so you have the Hispanic that's black. True. And, then and there's more. Less. Because yeah. we can also add in all the state dummies. So he has he does both of these in the book. Huh. You know, he doesn't do them in the same order, but he does these both in the book. So the, the state matter because each state might have a it's, it's asking you know it's the violation of that uh, you know assuming the treatment is the same. What is, I forget how he, there's a, what he called it in the last chapter, but the idea that the treatments mm -hmm. should be the same, but they're not going to really be the same because in different states they probably you know they're not that tightly coupled, right? Right. So we'll define those covariates. Um, now he just makes a formula for it. That's fine. He makes a formula that also includes the states. Okay. Yeah. So notice that the treatment variable is now the outcome, right? And you're doing, yeah. and you're doing, because yeah, we're doing, oh, yeah. Sorry. This, I didn't say what we're doing. So we're trying to calculate a propensity score, which what we're going to use here is the logic for the probability of being treated, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a nice continuous number that goes from minus infinity to infinity, which is convenient, right? Just do a logistic regression here, mm -hmm. which we do. We've done that a million times. Um, and he, then he extracts the, uh, the logit scores from it using Linfred, right? So we're just going to get the average. Not, we're not going to worry about all the fluctuations in it and everything else. We're just going to get the average. 
And now that was step two. Now step three is the matching. So the first, he gives two examples of this. Uh, there's other examples that he talks about later, um, but this is one particular example, just a direct matching. Uh, matching with replacement yeah, well, or uh, matching without replacement. And the idea is just to go into the, you know, for each treated guy, I'm gonna look in the control group and try to find the one that's closest in propensity score to me and use that as a match. And then without replacement, that guy's no longer available for the next one. Yeah. And you can see that means it's gonna matter what the order of the treated guys are. He talks about that later, but you know, there could be some issues, but that's, that's what it's doing. And mm -hmm. with replacement, you're gonna put them back. So multiple guys could end up with the same uh, match, right? Multiple treatment children could end up with a match. And mm -hmm. so it's actually gonna be like a weight. That's like a kind yeah. of a trivial weight in the sense. By the way, this can get, uh, this is just the basics from what little, I, I've actually read a book uh, by this guy, Robert Rosenthal, who's a famous um, medical person who's done, like he pioneered a lot of these techniques. And there are ones where you can have like multiple people matching with the same treated person. Yeah, he, talk, he matches it briefly. That's like, like K for one, uh, K for one, he calls it, but yeah, multiple people matching, pulling out multiple matches. Yeah, man, it, it gets it can get really, really dense. There's like I, I get the impression just because of this chapter is so dense that this yeah. topic must just and he had the bibliography at the end of the chapter. He does mention multiple resources that you could easily go down, yeah, and go down and study if you were this was something that you was your day job um, to do. <laughs> it's not for me, so I'm happy just to get the kind of the. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've, honestly, to me, this is a major uh, improvement in my knowledge. I never knew anything about this matching or yeah. intensity. This is all completely new to me. Never would even occurred to me to try yeah. something like that. I would have been happy with just doing a fit and saying, "Oh yeah, I can control form. I got there right there. See, I'm controlling yeah. Yeah. balancing. What are you talking about?" Uh, so, what are we doing here? I, I kind of got ahead of myself here. So, there's two things, by the way, that are kind of quickly being pushed under the rug. One is, what's this matching function? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I guess we can look in the guts of it, but we kind of, oh, why am I in this directory? Hmm. We can look in the guts of this, uh, here it is, balance function, uh, matching function, but we kind of know what it does, right? I mean, it's pretty clear that it's just going to take a look and find the one that's closest, right? No yep. problem there. Uh, now, this balance function is another thing altogether, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what this does. It takes all the, it takes the raw data, it takes the treated data, it takes the matches and somehow uh, does something. Yep. And this is part of where the book kind of like, just like kind of starts throwing things at, but, you know, but at you, right? Yeah. In fact, he doesn't, he just uses it here. Like if, you re, if you're reading through the book, you're like, what is this balance function? <laughs> I know, that's what I'm saying. It's like, he just doesn't explain things. I think they're just like, it's just, yeah, but you did the best you could. Yeah. So then if you go down to the next Actually, one, I thought I did know what it at least does. What does it do? Is it just making the plots for the balance for the plots? Is that what it does? Um, yeah, I, um, I have it too. I think I have it in my example too. Or I think I do. Maybe not actually. I, don't know. I might be using a different package. Um, but yeah, it's, I think what it does is, um, it's, uh, yeah, basically what you're doing is you're calculating the balance for each of the covariates. How well are they balanced? So the, you know, how the, the dots. That, oh, okay. That's what it's yeah, doing. That's what it's doing. I think. Oh yeah. Here you go. Here's the means difference in means. Okay. I get you now. Yeah. And the, and the variances as well. Okay. I got you now. All right, so it's just it's just it's not doing anything complicated. It's just a lot of nasty code that he didn't want to display. So that's fine. Mm -hmm. Did I evaluate all these yet? Yeah, I must have. All right. Okay. Well, no, we try to make these plots. Oh, yeah, I didn't do it yet. Well, no, we try to make these plots. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So that's the balance plot. So the point is that the open circles are the ones we already talked about. That's the imbalance. Now there's the new. Uh, with the matching, this new fake, not fake, but this new um, rebalanced data set, let's call it that, has much better um, balance, right? Yeah. Don't overlap though, we still care about that. And so that's step four, we're gonna diagnose, diagnose, di run some diagnostics on the balance and the overlap. And there's a lot of base R code here I'm not gonna look at, because I don't really understand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get the, anytime they have, I mean, it's like, you just gotta copy and paste those things blindly. It's like, you know, if you start <laughs> 
you start going line by line, you could drive you nuts. Well, you can, it's not. It's probably not complicated. It's, just, it's probably not. But yeah, take I mean, a while, I don't, right? I don't use base plotting yeah. that much, so I, I really need to get into it more. But yeah. And so yeah, the balance. This is what was the point of this? Oh, the point of this is he also took the. Uh, he this is this is similar to the part we just showed, except now he's treating the uh, indicator variables differently, mm -hmm. not taking not dividing by the standard deviation. And yeah. so yeah, what is how firstborn didn't get fixed that well? Like it's basically got worse, probably because there's just a yeah. lack. Of, there's probably just not like yeah. lack of overlap. Me, yeah. maybe there's not an overlap with the overlap thing or whatever. And speaking of overlap, we can look at the overlap. Oh, sorry, this is still, yeah, this is overlap. So here, this is, this is one thing he, he says, once you've established that you've got reasonably good balance, then look at the overlap. He makes clear, don't look at the overlap as a diagnostic at the beginning. Only look for it after you've established good uh, balance. Yeah. Uh, so where are we doing on time? Okay, we're good. Fine. So, so before balancing, you can see they look pretty bad. <laughs> and then yeah. after balancing, we improved both kind of the... Uh, uh, overlap and the um, balance. So that's that analysis. Uh, let's see, anything else useful here? Uh, so there's still some oh, lack of overlap. Uh, how many, let's see, how many P-scores are left out of the plot? Six, okay. That's not what I care about. Mm -hmm. This is what I care about, All right. So there's still 13 uh, in the treated group that are not well, over, that have no overlap in the, uh, in the control group that you might want to you know, mm -hmm. we might want to restructure the data to eliminate that if that's a problem, right? Or just be aware of it. You're gonna to have to use yeah. there's gonna be a little bit of extrapolation involved, at least from that. Uh that's as far as I want to go with that. The rest of this has to do with some additional examples. Yeah. Hey, let me give me let me I'll um I will share and I'll do my thing. Um uh, well, go... let me just quickly oh. uh I just want to wrap up the, the book part real quick if I can. Just oh sure, time. sure. Okay. Keep figuring how to get the back of the book. I just want to wrap up the book part real quick. All right, so let me move this over here. This we did all this. Oh yeah, so I stopped saying the words of the steps, but you remember step what the steps are. Okay, so step five. Step five is you have to. You may have to repeat this until you get good balance, right? Uh, how do you? What can you do about it? Well, you can change the score model. Maybe add some. Um, uh, interactions, maybe make it a linear or something to improve your score model or change your score model. And the other thing you could do is to maybe try a different matching method. Well, I did replacement, maybe we'll do it without replacement. I don't know, see if that improves the balance at all, right? Or use something completely different like K, K to one right thing. And once you've done all that, then you can ask me your treatment effect, which I didn't even look at in that, but you can, he did here, um, looking at what the treatment effect is. Again, you have to put in all these covariates back in again for that too. And in the, in the example, he just puts all the exact same covariates back in. Um, let's see. So now this next section just goes through the steps a little more detail. I'm just going to highlight some of the things I thought were interesting to me. If there's something I'm skipping over that you thought was important, no. please jump in. Um, one of the things was instead of using propensity, you could use other distance scores, which I thought was interesting. Um, for example, you could try like just using some kind of Euclidean distance that probably won't work very good because these things are all different units, but you could try like, you know, somehow doing that. And then he has this, what do you call this? It's called the Spanish Mahalanobis. Mahalanobis. And that tries to, you know, use the covariance to try to improve the, um, uh, some of the shortcomings of just doing a simple Euclidean distance. Uh, Mahalanobis is a super famous Indian statistician, I think. Ah, uh, okay. But yeah, and I they, imagine you could do other things. You could like do some kind of neural network that tries to find some kind of, you know, encoder decoder thing that finds some kind of small embedding space or something for all the parameters, right? Yeah. I imagine that could be, I don't know if that is done, but it occurred to me on my drive home today. Because um, mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of that deep learning stuff and other. You know, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, but in this case, he likes to, he's, the propensity score is the very common, apparently. I don't know if I, I shouldn't say it, but he, he implies it's very common. Yeah, you agree is. with that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's also you know a bunch of people that hate it. In those, you know, you can probably if you go in the literature and you find a bunch of propensity score models, and then you'll find a bunch of methodology papers saying propensity scores are the most evil thing that's ever happened. You know, it's like there's, you know what I mean? There's like like any kind of technique like this. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's there's always going to be those haters. So that. You know. But he makes the point that he doesn't show. He just it's one of these, it turns out that right. I love these. It turns out that. Uh, that if the covariates that are in the propensity score are sufficient to satisfy ignorability, then the 
conditioning on the propensity score is sufficient to satisfy ignorability. Mm -hmm. And I guess that makes sense because the propensity score itself, right, tells us that what is it? It's based on the probability that somebody got, it's a model for the probability that somebody got selected for treatment. So that should, uh, right? If you, if, you have, if you know that number, then that you can control for that and you can control for the, uh, uh, you, you can condition then. If you condition for that, then you would have balance on the outcomes, right? So that's basically what, how, it kind of makes sense. It's not a proof, but it kind of makes some sense that that should work, right? Mm -hmm. I had a better way of saying that before I were thinking about it. <laughs> I think I really still not quite convinced and, uh, by all that. But the, in some ways, the proof is in the pudding. And then when you actually do can do these uh, rebalancing on the matching using the propensity score or weighting with propensity score, and then you look at your balance, it it's actually is improved. So, <laughs> right? So there's, that's, it does seem effective. Uh, let's see. He talks about this idea that you, know, you might want to try to include every... Well, I'm not going to skip all that, right? Okay, fine, I read that. All right, so the next thing is how to restructure the data. He talks about options for that too. We use matching in the previous section, one-to-one, -one, but you can do, like you were talking about this K-to-one matching, right? Mm -hmm. uh, using more observations and, or this other thing, caliper matching. I actually yeah. have an example of that in mind. So. Okay, good. I won't say anything more about that. And again, he says, you know, there's a choice you have to make here about matching you use. Oh, he does make this point about if you're using matching without replacement, then you have to be aware that the order in which things are matched will affect the uh, yeah. what you end up getting chosen for which match comparison group. Okay, there you go. Um, then he talks about this completely different method of weighting, which appeals to me because it seems more universal. Mm -hmm. Is it weighting uh, the inverse probability, right? So oh. we're trying to rebalance that way. And he gives an example of that. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but this just oh yeah, it's a, that's a whole thing. Yeah. Technically, how to do it. Right, using those. Yeah, things. this this chapter, he's really bitten off more than he can chew. Yeah, but I mean, in, in, the, in the case of the child care, it does seem like waiting it, it did work pretty good. They got an estimate of eight point six, which is very close to what the experimental benchmark was. So, mm -hmm. so I'm like, well, why don't you just always do this? I don't know. I mean, just my <laughs> thought. Why are we messing around this matching thing when you just do this because propensity? I would say because most of the time you don't have enough covariates. Uh, I that see. would be my thing. Like you have whether or not people got some treatment or some experience or whatever. And then you've got, you know, two or three or four individual difference measures and just yeah. a million things that have gone, that you haven't measured. That's probably why. Right. So see, I think we mentioned this, don't use overlap to understand the thing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's one interesting thing in here. Um, oh, he does mention you want to look, worry about overlap in co confounders, not in covariates. There's other covariates. Now, see, I guess I, I kind of brushed over this, but remember, a confounder is not just something that affects the outcome, that's a covariate, but also affects treatment. So if you know for sure something didn't affect treatment selection, don't include it as a, uh, for in your propensity score or for looking or worry about overlapping it at all either, right? You still want to control for those covariates. Why? Because it can help reduce your statistical variance. Remember, we talked about that before. You're going to explain some of the variance so you get better fits, right? Uh, let's see. That's about going beyond the balance of means. You could also look at the, uh, you, know, you know, whether or not they're balanced. I mean, balance of means doesn't mean they're totally balanced. He gave an example early on where two skewed distributions have exactly the same mean, but they clearly were badly overlapped. You remember that? Yeah. And so you might want to also look at the balance in standard deviation and, or maybe just look at histograms, right? Uh, let's see. One thing, this is the last thing on this section that I thought was interesting. He talks about, you're iterating this process. And I agree, this, I'm, I'm proud of myself. When he's talking about iterating early on in this chapter, I'm like, well, wait a minute, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> you know, the garden of forking pass is, is, is yeah. sticking his little head out again. He does talk about that. And that you might do a balancing, and you might then just take a little peek at how well the fit is, you know, <laughs> with that, with that yeah. balance thing. So you gotta be careful about doing that because you can, you know, end up doing some p-hacking inadvertently there, right? Uh, let's see. Oh, and this final last section, I'm just gonna highlight this idea, which I thought was really interesting is, to conceptualize the whole observational study is what would it be if you could do, right? This as a true like experiment, true randomized, maybe even double randomized double blind experiment. What would, what would you do? And by conceptualizing, it helps you understand some of the issues, right? Understands mm -hmm. whether or not you have a well-defined idea even, right? Like he talks about like this height, you know, height can't be an effect because we can't imagine an experiment or at least yeah. it's hard to imagine an experiment where I like, oh, I'm going to make this guy taller, you know, because you need to have both outcomes possible, right? It's not possible for what would that tall guy be like if he was short? I mean, I guess you can imagine right. an alternate universe, 
I guess we get quantum mechanics in here. We can do it's not, right? it's, not, <laughs> not, it's not legitimately manipulable. Manipulable. That's what we call it. Yeah, manipulable. That's the key problem. Um, anyway, it's basically about again understanding the counterfactual state that actually something actually can exist, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, let's see. That's about. That's all I think. Oh, yeah. Same thing. What would be the idea? This is basically the same. It kind of repeats this kind of different ways, but the idea again. What's the ideal control experiment would be like? So. Something to think about. And of course, like he says, you know, you, you have to pretend that nothing matters, the morality, whatever. Like, I want to see if smoking causes cancer. I'm going to take like 10 people, make them smoke cigarettes, feed them, force feed them the exact same food, right? <laughs> Put them in a little uh, Truman Show world and see what happens, right? right. Actually, no, I got to do it with twins, right? So I'm going to take a bunch of twins, kidnap them. Okay, here's my plan. Yeah. And I'll make That's a exactly how food. behavioral genetics works. Yeah. Research works is you go out and get a bunch of monos, I got it, and I got a twin. And effectively the the dizygotic twins are the controls right because right. they have more genetic material than regular siblings and then but they share the uter interuterine environment well i'm saying go beyond that like if you want to do the true full experiment right you select the twins put one twin like in a truman show type uh, controlled environment <laughs> the other twins in a complete duplicate truman show environment and do everything else the same, make them eat, eat, feed the force feed them the same thing, everything else. And they make one twin smoke and the other one not, see which one gets cancer. <laughs> you know? And do that I with mean, a hundred of them. <laughs> I mean, people don't do that per se. I'm not gonna get approval from my experiment, but that's the kind of thing you have to actually think through. Now, with my real data, what can I do to, you know, how what you know, how can I get close to that, right? Yeah. In some sense. So I thought that was an interesting idea. No, it's it's cool. It's just like you said, it's just really dense. Um, so like I said, I uh, I'll just I did a couple examples. Well, Use this, um, and okay. So basically, this is the first empirical thing. So um, from the the exercises, the folder Lalonde, which is the name of the study from 1986, uh, data from an observational study um, based on a randomized experiment that evaluated. But first of all, you can see my screen. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, good, 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 sorry. Reading along. Um, I should have probably asked that first. Um, a randomized experiment that evaluated the effect on earnings of a job training program called National Supported Work. The constructed observation was formed by replacing the randomized control group with um, a comparison group formed using data from two uh, national public use surveys, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, this paper uh, is basically this day head Gia and the Waba, I guess is a well-known sort of uh, example of propensity score matching. Right, so we replaced the randomized control group with comparison group from a different study. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you do that? I mean, is this just this is for this is just for this uh, for educational purposes, right? There's no real reason to do that. Yeah, the paper, this paper, is, which I downloaded, it's like I think a lot of it is just like looking at how to apply. I mean, it's just it was okay. more about the application of propensity scores. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh value. I'm sorry, it was right there to evaluate the potential efficacy of propensity scores. Gotcha. Right. So the subsample they show uh, they chose removes men for whom only one pre-treatment measure of earnings is observed. So there's like three years. There's like okay. 1974, 1975, and 1978 is the is the uh, outcome year, I guess. There is evidence in the, uh, for adjusting earnings uh, from only one period is, is insufficient to give a good approximation of ignorability. So, um, okay. So the first one, I don't know even know if I did this right, but so it's basically it's like estimate the treatment effects. Um, from the experimental data in two ways, a simple difference of means, right. a control group, and then a regression adjusted estimate. That is um, the outcome. Um, so basically including the, the pretest. So, okay. You know, so. Um, so first you're just going to look at the treatment. Right yeah. Now on a control. All of a sudden, for some reason, this is really slow. Uh, I just ran this. And it, okay. Yeah. So here the treatment effect is such. So yeah, just to remind me. Okay. So this is like, so people that, that were treated made 1700 and so the, the, the it's income by the is way is it is that what yeah. it is in dollars okay yeah so i think this is the, so they made 1700 um 80 dollars more i guess so now this is not an effect this is uh what do you call it uh, so, uh the average this is literally the average the difference between the control group and the treatment group yeah so i guess that, that was what i didn't really get was like so we can't say that's the effect because it's really not the true treatment effect because we know there's compound. This right? is, but again, I didn't even really get the difference in means actually, to be honest. So I wasn't even it's sure. Same thing. That's the same thing. Yeah. I mean, that we showed early on the difference in means is the same as, as fitting on a. Yeah. So in this one, so now what I've done is this RE 74 and 75, this is what they made. So the, the outcome year is 70 okay. and 78. So now we have the treatment plus I've the added what they made for, in 74 and yeah. 75. And so I guess. 
Um, that makes sense. The, the, the reason why they got rid of a bunch of people is they only had data in one of these two years, 74 or 75. Okay. So now, we, we're, you know, so that's this a confounder then? What's that? That's a confounder or just? No, no, no. I think they're just talking about, we're not doing confounding it. We're just doing a regression okay. adjusted estimates, right? Which basically means just taking covariates into okay, covariates, consider okay. consideration. So the only thing we're doing is looking at where they were before, right? So um, now you'll notice, okay, so we went from 17, 7, 1780 to 1773. All right, so not, not important. Not, not a huge important thing, covariates. Right? But then, so now use regression analysis to estimate the causal effect of this. So basically the paper that you, that we're basing this whole thing on. The subsetting. So, yeah. So basically all they really wanted us to do here is just like add covariates. At least, at least that's the way I'm reading it. And so I just was like, okay. Um, I ended up just kind of fooling around and I specifically, I thought, okay, here's something interesting, right? So like, let's look at the Let's, let's look at the interaction between treatment and age, right? So older people, you know, probably are not going to get as much benefit because they're later and they're set in their ways and, you know, stuff like that. And so here's what's interesting, right? I, I mean, by the way, we can fool around with this and add and take things out. Um, I took out, I don't know why I took out the, um, okay, just look at this. Look at now, look at oh, what, what happened. You know, be, you know why? Because of this, I, I'm pretty sure. Right. So if I take this out, and by the way, I should probably have put in this too. Sorry. Um, so you know, look, when I took the okay. when, I, when I take that uh, the interaction out, it's sixteen thirty five, but now I'm going to do age by treat again. Is age normalized? No, probably not. <laughs> so you have to. So you'd have to. It's a little bit more or less straightforward to interpret, right? Because you have to add in, you know, the average age multiplied yeah. by the coefficient of age treat, right? right? So age treat is eighty-seven. So you have to multiply that by what are the average to get some kind of average effect, right? You need to multiply that by the average age, and then. Right. Subtract off. I mean, so it's not I'll, a negative I'll, treatment effect. It's actually going to still be a positive treatment effect, probably. Right. So, like forty. Oh, years. is that right? Because I didn't center it. Yeah. Oh well, then never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. I suspect. Well, we can do a quick estimate. Right. Just take the mean. Take the mean age. Multiply it by. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Here. Let me do that. Yeah. So we could say. No, no, don't don't mess with your data frame. But you could, I guess. Well, I'm just gonna make I gotta make a center age, right? So oops, that's not what I wanted. Oh, actually, I should probably should do a mutate function sitting here, right? Oh not having a oh yeah, okay. Um uh, minus mean age, right? Super. Mean. I guess is there um sure. know, let's, see, let's see if that even let's see what let's see what uh if that is this if there's any missing data I don't know probably there is oh no there isn't so we got we actually got stuff okay good all right, all right. so try that again with uh interaction on center age and I guess also use center age as your covariate in the fit Oops, sorry. Goodness. It all starts to look the same after a while, doesn't it? I know. Yeah, I've been looking at code all day. My brain is is hurting. You should put oh, oh sorry, I just I just realized I forgot to put center age in. I think that should matter. Well, let's let's Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Now we got now the treatment back the same as it was before. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, all right. And then okay, so then the next one is okay, now estimate using propensity score. So yeah, that that one up above was just to kind of I mean we could have put in a bunch of different things yeah. to describe them, but the point yeah, is yeah. That, yeah. that the that the um the treatment effect is affected by what kinds of things that we adjust for. And it's possible, you know, like in a way, like you know. 
if we leave out say education um because we just don't want to put it into a model obviously we can add it later and, and see what happens but some there's a lot of maybe what if we hadn't measured the education right education seems important yeah right, right. of course okay so they basically want to just look at like propensity scores okay so um I had to use just regular GLM stuff because uh, I, I wasn't prepared to like update my code to fit in with, you know, with what he was doing because I just couldn't understand it. So basically, we're gonna we're going to um, take the fitted values and then we're going to make these linear uh, predictor values, which we'll be using to um, to kind of match and, and balance everything. So okay. if you can see here. Uh, we want to say high PS for the propensity score if, if it's like greater than 0.99 and if it's less than 0.01. So we want we want this kind of stuff here. Like I, I didn't write all this code in, uh, originally, but it um I'm, and I only did it with replacement just because I you know I wanted to like right. show an example. So now so the capital started, match function comes from a, a library. Which library is that? It comes from the Cobalt. Oh, okay. Yeah, Cobalt. I think package. I'm pretty, or, or no, no. Maybe it's the ARM package, actually. Oh, I forget. I forget which one it is, either Cobalt or... Uh, yeah, I, I just brought in all the packages that I... When I did that, right. I, I did this like five years ago. Um, and now, for some reason, it's not giving me... What did I do? Um, what is the problem here? Why is this? I, I, I This just worked a minute ago. I swear to God. Um... What the hell? I'm supposed to just do a t test. And so, by the way, so for some reason it's not giving me the t values. I might move on and see if I can fix it later. But so here's okay. the deal: we had, we had 445 original observations all all told, and we had um, 185 treated people, right? And so we actually, yeah. So um, we had, we were able to match. Uh, all all of those right now let's see if right. this works for god's sakes all of a sudden yeah okay right so this shows us sort of like you know the what the, the differences is and then like, you know what the sample size is now this is the love plot right um the love plot love plot right <laughs> yeah. um okay yeah so i don't know if you can see these dots they're not super big yeah i can definitely see it. they're like teal and, and salmon color so right? one of your adjustments like threw the thing off yeah. Um, so you can see here, even with adjustment, things like education aren't doing super great. But this is also notice how this isn't a huge difference. I mean, like, right. Oh, that's yeah. Okay. Yours were like your 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 x axis was like going out like a couple. Oh, so these weren't that badly balanced to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. I guess not. So. Um, yeah. So then. Um, oh yeah. So this is now. Treatment. Okay. So yeah, this works. Yeah, for some reason, though, I don't know why. What did I do differently? Oh, whatever. Screw it. Who cares? We're almost out of time anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So now, um, this we we we're running. We're using this match thing to show that you know after we take in you know that we take into consideration all of the, uh, the the linear propensity scores right so that's what in this case x equals x is meaning it's what we're saying okay use this as a way of balancing these two things and then and then do a t-test basically just to look at the differences and of course that difference is significant um okay. and we've matched 185 <coughs> people now this whole concept of calibers I basically what I think it means is you you set a kind of like like just like the yeah, real little, calibers little, little you, set, you set some kind of like range of like how different you're allowing them to be to make a match and so you can set these as like fatter or like yeah. narrower obviously the narrower you do it the the harder it is going to be for you to match you know so let's so just to remember this remember this the the t value two point nine one okay. Yeah, zero, zero. So now we're going to use calipers of uh, 0.25. And now notice how now we only have matched 168 people, right? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Because yeah. it's we've made it, we've, we've set a higher bar. Yeah. Let's yeah. do this. Let's see what happens when we just do like 0.1. It goes down even more, right? So you can do, you know, 0.05. So now it's like the, the, the tighter and tighter, uh, 149 right so the tighter, okay. the tighter you set those calipers the harder so if, if we leave it tight and you go look at how well it does yeah it'd be interesting to see the balance plot right 
Yeah, so hold on. So let me do the 0.25 first, and then I'll come back to that. So now we, we're back to um, 168, right? Okay. So so I like I like to look at the figures because, you know. It's easier, yeah, to understand. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can see these are a, a lot closer, you know, and also, you know, like the. the oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right. Except for 70, RE75 just won't, won't balance. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. lack of overlap there. Yeah, so let's do this. I'll go back and I'll set I'll set this to like something real, really tight, like 0.05, which you probably would never do. But yeah, so the, the calipers are a way to okay, yeah, 149. Yeah, yeah. So we've dropped so we've dropped 36 people because it's just the calipers just took away those the ability to match stuff. So now let's see this. Okay, so we see this is what it looks like now. Right. And Yeah, so I, I wonder if there's no overlap in the 75 because just that won't budge. I mean, it budges, but it like goes. Wait, it makes it worse every time. Why? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 um, yeah. I mean, well, no, actually, not, well, I mean, it's a little bit worse, I guess, but it's just going in the opposite direction. I'd have to be. Was it, it, to was the, uh, it was in the. It was in the. What's that? that? Is that truly a confounder? I don't. I don't know. Okay, yeah. I, um my attitude was like okay you know what they made you know prior to the treatment should be something that, that you'd want to control for right no but did it affect whether they're in the out did it affect the treatment is the question right I, I i don't yeah that's a good question i don't know um so okay yeah so i'm back to 0.25 and now um this is yeah so this t value went down a little bit yeah so basically by adding calipers we, we got a slightly less like robust finding whatever right. uh, whatever that means but we also, but we feel more. We have a, we've quantified like the limit of you know difference or, or ma how we match stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. So anyway, that's that's all I got, and uh, you know we, that's we, cool. We end up using the whole dang time anyway. So there you go. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, so reminder, um, yeah. Um, for now, so so next week I will do chapter twenty one, and then chapter twenty two is it, right? Yep. So not next.